Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the show. And with my guest today, we're, we're going to be talking about the uh, pre-budget. We have um, the Honorable uh, Craig Simmons, lecturer at the Bermuda College, especially in uh, economics. Dr. Claudette Fleming for Age Concern. And John White from the Chamber of Commerce and BFNM. Welcome, guests. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's jump into it. How mm -hmm. useful was the pre-budget? I mean, they did it last year, they've done it this year. I mean, I think it's a great exercise to go through. As you say, it's been done very infrequently over the last several years, but I think in terms of ensuring transparency with the ideas that the government's considering for the upcoming budget, it's a, a very good way to sort of throw out some trial balloons and just see what the reaction is from uh, all aspects, uh, all walks of life of Bermuda. So I think you know, the minister himself uh, has gone to public forums, he's met with a lot of private organizations, I think he's received some terrific feedback. Um, so I think it, from that perspective, it's accomplished its goals. Now, in particular, uh, Dr. Fleming, you, you had a issue with the ARV as long, not just you, but a lot of people did. And in that part of the process, how do you, you know, how do you feel like you've accomplished something by giving your feedback? Well, I, I think it certainly beats the old days where you got the news on budget day. Um, and I also commend the minister. Um, he had made his mind up, um, not just from presentations like ours, but uh, the voices of the community were heard, heard through this process. Um, and so it bids well for democracy. Now, what were your main concerns with the ARV rental tax? Our concerns were that uh, seniors were concerned about the implications. Hmm. Um, not that the proposal in of itself is not something that should be looked at, but um, the thresholds and the execution, uh, what are the potential unintended consequences to the seniors who are trying to protect uh, their income and maintain a quality of life in this current economy. So uh, we had more questions um, than we had definitive answers as to how to go about it. And uh, we felt strongly that uh, those questions should be answered before uh, a tax of any kind is introduced. And the minister, I think, uh, agreed with that. Do you see, will the, see this reintroduced at some point in the future or, or at maybe at a different uh, ARV point? I think um, it, at some point it will be um, uh, revisited. I think the purpose was to look at um, multiple um, land, uh, owners of uh, properties that have many, many properties. Uh, in our, most seniors in Bermuda own or have equity in their own home. I think it's something like 60 or 70%. And many have created um, income units in the beginning to support things like uh, education, um, building up the house, the equity in the house, etc. And then in the older years to support uh, long-term care needs. And that needs to be taken into consideration as to what that income is actually used for. In the case where um, the income is used for disposable means, um, then there may be um, latitude for taxation. The challenge is, how do you determine that? What's the vehicle? Um, is there a cost-effective way to create a mechanism that can look at that? And how is that done? And I think um, the more time is needed for that. Craig, uh, just get you involved here. Uh, what do you think about what Claudette just said? Um, well, land tax, land as the most immobile thing that you can tax is an obvious target. It's going to be a target for the next uh, decade or so. Um, land taxes right now make up about 7% of the budget. Um, it really has to go uh, into double digits. Um, the government's going to have to collect north of $130 million a year. Um, well, let, let's back up. Um, public en enemy number one is the debt. You've got $2.5 billion worth of debt that has to be paid off. Um, some of which is becoming, is due, what, just before 24th of May and more uh, in November. So there is that. You, you can't get around that. Um, and, and given that debt is public enemy number one, you've got to raise taxes. Um, taxes have to be simple. Um, they need to be efficient to the extent that you don't want people trying to be, uh, avoid them or evade. And land tax, 
uh, fails uh, that, that particular, those criteria. It's really, really simple. It's based on the ARV, which the government has been co um, collecting for some time. And it's difficult. You can't move land. You can move mm -hmm. jobs off island. You can move capital off island. You can't move land. And so for that reason, um, we need to get ready. If you own land, know that the tax collector is coming after you. Uh, if you don't want to pay tax, move out of land <laughs> and buy shares in companies that you can, um, I don't know, oversee, oversee shares. But land is, is going to be the target for the tax collector for the foreseeable future. Right. Part of the thing is I, when I came and I, when I have a, a, my own house and the mortgage is almost ready to be paid off next month. Um, but I always thought like the land tax is really low compared to uh, my friends that are in Canada and the United States. You know, and it is for those for those uh, first two bands. Um, the, the land tax is absurdly low. Um, we're talking like a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Many places are under paying two hundred dollars in land tax, which is it, it's absurd. And so um, the, the the minister has decided to increase. He has no other choice because. At the, at the top end, um, marginal rates are nearing 50%. So the only place to increase taxes would be at the bottom, which of course is going to aggravate those people at the bottom. A lot of people, seniors, uh, middle class people. But um, what else are you supposed to do? Again, you, 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 there's very little you can do at the top end. Right. Part of, I guess part of the thing is like the government, or this government at least, has um, had trying to promote equality, um, trying to make sure like the people at the bottom um, not have to pay as much as, as the people at the top and it seems like taxing the people at the, at the bottom end of the IRV scale regardless of what you're going to do is going to be an irritant. Most definitely. Well taxes are going to be an irritant, <laughs> a period. Yeah. I think the, there has to be a balance to, to, to show people where are those tax dollars going. If, if I am not able to uh, buy food, if I cannot acquire health care at an affordable uh, rate, um, if I cannot send my children to school, um, then what are these taxes for? And that is the real challenge, not so much that we are grown up and when we grow up we move out and we take care of our own expenses, that is to be expected, but where are, are those monies going to um, improve or enhance uh, my quality of life? And that question is, is still to be answered. You mentioned like you, uh, you have to raise taxes, but wouldn't increasing the tax base by um, having more companies or more, or more people here, wouldn't that also help alleviate some of that tax burden? Well, I think you know, the pre-budget report um, makes reference to the fact that we need more economic activity, more jobs in Bermuda. So without question, when we lost those 6,000 odd people, you know, following the 2007-2008 global recession, um, they had a profound impact on the economy that has been um, hampering our ability to uh, have growth since that period. So I think it's going to be difficult to meet our objectives financially as a country if we continue just to tax the number of people that we have in our workforce right now. So I think uh, you know, the, the tax base has to be seen to be fair and equitable. The taxes imposed in the, by the various parties, it's got to be collectible by government. One of the big issues that people are upset about is the fact that I think on the government balance sheet, we have about $200 million of receivables from payroll taxes and the like that were never collected over the years. So I think, you know, people want to see fairness and equity in the imposition of either new taxes or increases in existing taxes. And, uh, you know, th they'll be more willing to um, to pay their fair share if everybody else is doing the same thing. So I think, you know, fairness and equity is, is important, but to your point, um, it, you know, it's with a, we pay $124 million a year in interest. As Craig alluded to, some of these payments are going to be reset in 2019 and probably or perhaps a higher interest charge. So uh, with that in mind, you know, we want to broaden our tax base, but frankly, it's going to be very challenging to, uh, to be able to do that at a time when, uh, when so many people are having difficulty making ends meet as it is, so to impose more taxes on them, whether it be uh, people, as Claudette says, people that are having difficulty paying health care, uh, making ends meet, 
um, they just can't afford to, to pay much anymore. So we, we desperately need more people on the island. I think the discussion has to be you know, a, a frank discussion about why do we need these people? How many do we need? Because you remember that during the, I guess the glory days before 2009, people were saying there was too much traffic mm -hmm. on the roads, that the economy was overheated. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, but there has to be a frank discussion around what, what is that number? Why do we need them? And, um, uh, and to quite its point as well, if the tax base gets increased, where are these tax dollars going? Um, mm. So there's a lot of, of questions that have to be answered, but I think the, the initial discussion is we, we have to be better at having these frank discussions that may be contentious. Well, um, democracy is a messy business. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of having a pre-budget report, um, I'm thinking, if I was the finance minister, the last thing I would in the world I want is a pre-budget report. I just want to walk up on the hill, open my suitcase and say, bam, here it is. Yeah. No feedback. Uh, but, you know, in the 21st century, you've, you've, you've got to appeal to your populace, you know, and that's hard work. Um, the finance minister had to deal with uh, some, some, some pushback. I mean, you know, the, the rental tax was, was sort of supposed to be, what, raised like $41 million? Mm -hmm. so th there was a, a lot at stake. And to, to, to say, well, we're not going to do it right now, mm -hmm. well, that took a lot of uh, testicular fortitude, a lot of humility. But that's, that's the nature of democracy. Um, explaining to people that right off the top, I mean, if we collect a, a thousand million dollars in taxes, 200 of them goes to debt service, right off the top. And if, if that's not addressed immediately, well, you're gonna have less money uh, to take care of seniors. You're gonna have less money for healthcare. You're gonna have less money for education. Um, there's no question about it. That's why I, I'm, I'm suggesting that public enemy number one is the debt. And uh, you know we have to, as someone say, put on our big girl panties and deal with it. And, and we're all gonna have to pay. We're, we're, we're all gonna suffer. Some will suffer more than others. Like I say, people that own land, that's a target. Um, it, because it's difficult to, to, to expect people to pay more unless they have to. Right. Yeah? Um, when it comes to, you know, John's running a, a department, he can, he can take the option of saying, well, I'm not going to do that particular job in Bermuda. I'm going to move it to Halifax in order to avoid taxes. Yeah. I can do my little uh, tax uh, avoidance thing by saying, well, I'm not going to pay um, the duty on the energy. I'm going to ride my pedal cycle. Right. But there are limitations on that. You know, we, we've got to come up with this 1,000 plus million dollars for the next 10 years. And I think we recognize that payroll tax is not the solution. So, you know, this um, you know, tax on payroll has been seen in a prior um, uh, election to be a non-starter because it was tried unsuccessfully, jobs left the island. So the reality is that, you know, if you impose higher taxes on labor, jobs can and will move elsewhere. So um, that is our biggest collector of taxes right now. So, yeah. you know, with that being the biggest tax, uh, collector of taxes and then actually talking about lowering that, the payroll tax, and that, that means there's got to be a lot of tough decisions to broaden the tax base in other areas, and that's no easy task for the minister. Yeah, but I mean, the, I guess the main thing, and Premier Burt's really aware of this, is you've got to create jobs. Yeah. And, and, you know, he's making the effort trying to do so in the fintech, which really hasn't started rolling yet, so where are these jobs going to come from? Well, by its very nature, government is not the entity that creates jobs. Mm -hmm. um, it is the entity that assists in creating an environment that is conducive uh, to job creation. Um, the private sector, for the most part, is the entity that creates jobs. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, um, there are sustained discussions with the private sector um, about what are the, the best conditions uh, for this to happen. I know that there is an interest in looking at the need for um, more people uh, for the economy. Um, that has to be balanced against the political um, landscape. And those conversations have, have to be had. And, and the politicians and those who create jobs have to hold hands in educating the public as to why it's important and how it's going to work. The public's voice is going to be important in how it's going to work. And then this has come up, why, why would we be interested in age concern? Because local business supports us 
And we've mm-hmm. heard this time and time again that um, there isn't a voice for us as small business. It concerns us at Age Concern because small to medium businesses provide opportunities uh, for Bermudians to be employed. Um, they, those employees take care of older people, they take care of younger people, they buy stuff in the community. These businesses provide discounts, concessions to older people. Um, these are the people who will help us to create the jobs. And um, there is a feeling that there is not enough discussion, meaningful and substantive discussion, and I'll, I'll um, turn it over to John uh, in his chamber room. But um, it's very important for us not to kill small to medium business in this country, to look at some of the implications of the decisions that we're making. If we want these jobs, they have a role to play and yeah. they should be hard. I think one of the things that you uh, said to me earlier was that you know, it creates a lot of entry level positions for people Correct. as well. Correct. Mm-hmm. So maybe somebody who's not really ready to work at a, a, a full fledged, but just coming into the economy, mm-hmm. it's, it's helpful for these young people to get their foot in the door. Absolutely. I think to follow on Quinnette's comment about you know, one of the valuable lessons I've learned coming on as chamber president was how critical small and medium businesses are to our economy. You know, in the old days, um, there would be a catastrophe somewhere in the world, and you know there'd be an insurance, a reinsurance formation, huge job creation. You know, that's not the model for insurance reinsurance mm-hmm. anymore. So, so it's so critically important that small and medium-sized businesses can grow and prosper, and that's um, you know that, that's the challenge that we're uh, in comfort, um, we have right now in our economy. Well, one of the biggest. Um blockages, barriers to SMEs, small and medium enterprises, is the lack of capital. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, as opposed to debt. So mm-hmm. if, you, if you're running a business, there's two ways to raise money. You can go to the bank and borrow and do the debt financing thing, or you can go to a, a stock market, an equity market. And we really don't have uh, such an entity, as, at least as it relates to stocks, to equity, on island. Where does a small business go to get funding? Um, really the only place would be BDIC and um, they're going to turn you on to a bank or they may be able to dip into their their funds. But to my way of thinking, that is the biggest barrier to growth. Um, What can the government do about that? Well, it it is, um, Robert Stubbs has highlighted the fact that, you know, our savings rate in Bermuda is north of 30%. So for every one dollar that we save, in in excess of 30 cents is saved. But just about all of that money leaves the island in the form of pension funds, um, mutual funds, and very little of it is staying on island. Um, if, we're, if we're looking for a role for government or the Bermuda Monetary Authority to play, it would be to, to legislate that a certain percentage of any new savings should be kept on island. Um, in, in the days of exchange control, this, but in the, in the early 90s, um, there was a thing called overseas investment tax which I believe was like 10%, so that if you were going to move your savings off-island, you're going to pay 10% up front before you make your first penny. I'm not suggesting that we go back to those uh, those days, but um, we've gone from one extreme to the other, where we, we stifled or we, we prevented overseas investment, to now where um, we're in fact incentivizing it. And I think it's, it's showing up on the ground with small and medium-sized enterprises not being able to get the capital that they need to grow and in turn um, provide job opportunities for working class Bermudians. And I think the, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is, is alive and well in the U.S. and the U.S. is an area where there is a lot of capital for young people to, if they have good business models, to be able to access. Mm-hmm. Um, and once that capital is accessed, then they can get bank loans on top of it and prosper. But as Craig says, we don't have that capital available in Bermuda, so um, so banks, understandably, you know, aren't willing to lend as they would be able to if there was capital that could be drawn upon for these small businesses. Yeah. And the other um, place where jobs can grow, I think this is where maybe we should uh, be thinking about job growth, is with respect to hospitality. Yeah. Um, the BTA has done a, a marvelous job of, of growing the business growing uh, air arrivals, growing yacht arrivals, um, growing um, rental um, um, units. Um, and so to my way of thinking, that is a great way to provide employment for, for the unskilled. Um, my, my biggest fear in Bermuda is the rise of populism 
the kind of thing we've seen in Britain with Brexit and, the th and in the States with um, the rise of um, Trump and so on, that people lose faith in the ability of the economic system to do good by them. And one good indicator of the success, I think, of our system is the ability of people at the bottom to make it to the middle and to the top. And uh, if, if, if the U.S. And, the, and Great Britain are any indicators, they've done a very poor job of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the data looks like for Bermuda, but my sense is that populism will grow when mobility between the classes is severely limited. And um, we, we need to make sure that we do right by people who are at the bottom and give them uh, the ability and the hope that they can do uh, better. Yeah. What do you see in the budget, the, the pre-budget report, that, that would give you hope for that? Um, you know, the, 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 the ongoing thing with education. I mean, education is arguably the most effective way to promote mobility between the classes. Um, there's no two ways about it. Um, a, what do they call it, a, a guaranteed income is not going to do it. Um, but education will allow people to move up. I mean, institutions like Bermuda College are arguably the most effective way to get people to move up. Um, elite schools like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton can, can, can elevate people, but not very many of them because, well, most of the people that go to those top universities are already rich. Um, but community colleges and second and third tier uh, institutions, that, to my way of thinking, is the way mm -hmm. to provide hope for people at the bottom. Right. Uh, right out of the gate, government um, uh, instituted that they were going to pay, um, had funds set aside for students who wanted to go to Bermuda College, could go. What have you seen as, as an impact? Well, there, there is an impact. I mean, the, the, the dual enrollment program, making it more affordable for working class Bermudians to, to go to college, but there needs to be more. Um, school fees are the smallest part of the cost of going to college. Yeah? The biggest cost of going to college is the lost income. Yeah? You're giving up a job making, let's say, $30,000 a year. If I'm a full-time student, uh, how am I going to pay rent? How am I going to you know, buy food? Um, so we, we need to do more to, to convince our students that education is, in fact, their ticket to success. One of the other longer, well, not even that long, but... Uh, problems is Bermuda's aging population. You know, this, the census came out with the report saying that 24.6 percent of the population by 2026 was going to be 65 and older, um, which is a, uh, the term I guess is a super aged population. And you know we see this you know, other Western society countries dealing with this with this problem. Um, I, and I shared with Claudette, in one of our talks is like in Japan they now sell more adult diapers than they do baby diapers. Mm -hmm. You know, what's besides just the pension, what sort of other problems does this this create for Bermuda? Well I mean health I guess where do I start, but I mean health care number one, oh. um, long term care for so many of Claudette's mm -hmm. um, members, mm -hmm. um, the ability to pay down the debt that's so critical that um, Craig referred to um, you know, countries like Canada have taken proactive views about immigration. Well, Canada announced recently that they're going to be bringing in 300,000 people per year for the next three years, which is about 1% of their population on the basis that they know that they can't sustain their economy without bringing people in from the outside. So, you know, we're not going to be, we're not going to reverse our aging population. I mean, it, it is what it is, and even if people start having more babies now, it would be, you know, 15, 20 years before we saw the, the effects of it. So, you know, we, we've got to look at this as being a fairly critical situation that may, may seem to a lot of people to be um, not obvious to them, but the ramifications that we don't start dealing with now are going to be, are going to be dreadful for the island. So Yeah, when you look at the numbers, I mean, uh, in 2017, there were like 500 and maybe 30 births, mm -hmm. and there were like 480 deaths. Mm -hmm. You think, wow. Mm -hmm. um, and to, this, to the issue of healthcare, when you look at the, um, the data, um, once you go 50, healthcare costs start to increase exponentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 20s and 30s, those guys are pretty, pretty flat. Mm -hmm. But boy, when you turn 50, it's just steep, steep and, and, and continues. 
And the fact that one in four Bermudians very soon is going to be over 65. I mean, this is, this is not a pretty picture. Um, Health care at the moment, isn't it um, pretty close to the top uh, in yeah, terms of a budget item? It is, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and, and it's up there with debt service. It's, uh, well, seven, actually, the, we spend $700 million a year uh, in Bermuda on health care. So yeah. for a population of roughly 60,000 people, I think we're the second or third most expensive place in the world to deliver health care. So, mm -hmm. um, so f you know, for the reason that's cited, this is something that we, uh, we have to look at as a matter of urgency in, in Bermuda. But I would encourage us, yeah, there is that, and it's big, um, but there's also opportunity. There's also opportunity there. We have to, um, what is the saying that necessity is the mother of invention? We have to do something different. And um, we have enough examples around us, around the world, of what doesn't work. Um, some of the healthcare systems that are not financially sustainable social security systems that are not uh, sustainable, the percentage of GDP uh, to care for um, an aging population. We know this. Um, we have an opportunity to do something different. And so what are the opportunities? When you asked, Craig, uh, what comes out of this um, budget proposal, some of the good things. Um, education, I agree. Not just uh, education, um, the institutional type or the type that takes place for younger people, but also the education to the Bermudian public about the budget process, about um, the financial conditions of the country, why it is important for every Bermudian to understand the ramifications of, of what, what, what not doing something is going to mean to them personally. I think that is the most important part of the budget and we need to bring the conversations forward um, and take some risks, some calculated risks, but some risks. Um, I believe that we should look at the, um, oversee the money that we're sending overseas to invest and the opportunities to invest it here. And I would go so far as to say that would include pension dollars. Oh. And um, that's an education process for older adults um, and those who are of us who are contributing to um, the pension system. Show the, the, the pros and the cons. If we don't do something, if we do not invest capital into our own community, who is going to do it? Yet this money is leaving. The argument is made that, well, there won't be a return for you in your retirement. Um, because the reason why we're investing overseas is because you can make money. These are sure things and there are professionals that, you know, um, they are in charge of your money and they're making sure that you're going to get a return. Okay, that is true. But if we don't invest in our country, what are we going to do with that money? So is there an opportunity to, um, even if it's a very small percent, to use some of this pension dollars to invest it back into the local economy. Is there even an appetite to have that conversation? I know it's been had before. Well, to, be, to, to be frank, I think there are huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. Whenever our government uh, goes to the market to borrow, it's always oversubscribed. It's Bermudians who will say, well, no, I'm not going to invest in this government because you know they're on the verge of bankruptcy. But institutional investors jump on uh, whenever we, we issue debt. Yeah, they have no problems with, with lending us money. Um, with the airport, there was no problem in finding uh, investors and ACON was simply a front for pension funds and, um, and, and other sources of savings who were willing to put $300 million down. So there are people who are keen to, to invest in Bermuda. Um, we Bermudians need to see what they see. The fact that we are producing that we're saving in excess of 30% of our, of our dollars uh, is something that doesn't happen in the U.S. It doesn't happen in the United Kingdom. It happens in places like Japan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong. So there, there's something very attractive about Bermuda. We choose not to see it. it and I think it's, perhaps it's related to the me first, that we have no sense of, of, of civic pride. You know, um, it's all about me. You know, 
how is, how is the increase in tax going to affect me, rather than uh, the fact that we have $2.5 billion in debt, and, 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 and we're all beneficiaries of that. We like to drive on smooth roads. Mm -hmm. We like to go to a hospital that is modern. Um, we love to send our kids to school. So um, we need to be honest with ourselves and, and, and realize that the money, the billion dollars that is spent, uh, we are the beneficiaries of it. And that the outstanding, the, the debt, uh, we are the beneficiaries of it. And we have a civic responsibility to pay it down. Now, individualism, and there are, there's a place for individualism, but I think it's, it's gone perhaps too far. No, not perhaps, it has gone too far. Where, where Bermudians are thinking, it's all about me. Me first, me second, and me third. And anything, anything left over me again. Well, <laughs> that is not the way um, nations operate. You know, there has to be a sense of, well, you know, I'm proud to be a Bermudian. Um, I stand by my country. I'm willing to invest in my country. Uh, without that, I'm, we can, you can make all the money you want. Yeah. It's not going to help. And we are making enough. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're saving 30% of our income tells me that we're making enough. We need to sort of put aside the excuses and actually roll up our sleeves and understand that this is our country and feel proud about being a part of the future of our country. Um, individualism, I think, is, is undermining um, our growth prospects. Mm -hmm. I think for the average Bermudian, if you said like you could have invested in the airport project, to potentially make money, most of them wouldn't have had any idea of how to do that. How do we educate people about, about maybe taking part and taking ownership of our own country and our own land? I think it's just a lack of belief because um, when you send your, when your pension fund sends money overseas, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the pension money in Bermuda has been invested in the airport. Yeah? Pension fund puts the money overseas, gives it to a, a, an investor. The investor then takes the money and places it in various pots that he or she thinks are profitable to the investor. Bermuda is a great place to, to invest your money. Um, we have no excuse for, for not being a part of, of, of the financing of our airport. We certainly have the money. At the end of any given year, our savings are north of a billion dollars, a thousand million. The airports are costing a paltry $300 million. You mean to tell me that we as a people were unable to come up with the funding for the airport? I think that speaks rather poorly of, of Bermudians as a people who believe, who don't believe in, in the future of their own country. I, I think if we, can, if we can somehow get our economy to settle down, I think there will be much more investment in Bermuda. If you look back to when foreign exchange controls were relaxed in the late 80s, there was a concern that there'd be so much Bermuda currency flowing into foreign currencies. The reality was that there wasn't a great deal of that. The concern that was expressed by many people never came to fruition. So I think, you know, if we can get the, the budget balanced, start paying back our debt, I think you'll see a greater confidence in Bermudians willing to reinvest in our country. So I'm really hoping that we don't get to a point where we have to impose restrictions on, on currency leaving Bermuda. Mm -hmm. I would rather see it be the other way around. We get our economy in such a state that people will choose to invest in Bermuda rather than send their money overseas. That's one, obviously one of the challenges we have going forward. Yeah, that would be an awesome, awesome <laughs> if we could do that. Um, one of the things the Premier floated last year, uh, trying to deal with the aging population, well, I, I didn't float it with me, but he he's said it in an interview while, while I was interviewing him, was um, raising the retirement age to a, a different number as we've seen happen in other countries. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, especially those close to retirement age, sort of panicked, thinking like, oh, he's gonna make it 67 mm -hmm. and I'm 64 and a half, not realizing that, well, no, you're gonna be grandfathered and it'll be set back a little bit so it's not sprung on you. But how much of a reality, I know there's a lot of people who are 65 plus who can still contribute to the economy yeah. and still wanna work, Although some people may be a little bit put off having to work to 67 or 68. It's a huge reality and it's likely to happen. And mm -hmm. That's for economic reasons, uh, because of the demographic shift and the need for more people to be contributing to the current um, social insurance, contributory pension in mm -hmm. particular. So it, it more than likely will happen in the, in the not so distant uh, future. However, uh, there are those that feel that that probably doesn't go far enough from a human rights perspective. 
uh, because you're still talking about an age restriction. And there are those who believe that there should not be an age restriction, that we should not have an age period, um, and that you should have the right to work, particularly with the expectation in this economic environment that you, will, you can financially sustain yourself. Why limit um, an individual's ability to participate in the market, to care for themselves based on some arbitrary number called age? Um, so um, I don't think that there will be a lot of pushback. I haven't, I think there will be some, some flexibility around uh, when people choose to retire. Um, however, I think there will be those who feel, why do we need a number uh, in the first place? Um, in, in countries like Japan, um, one of the strategies that they are using is to use more older people um, in uh, fulfilling jobs um, as a market, um, you know, to sell products to, because in your retirement, the money is saved to spend. And so um, looking at those dollars um, in terms of, you know, generating income. So again, another place of opportunity. I, I think it will, it will come for various reasons and it will be interesting to see how the public reacts. Like a like hundred years ago when Social Security was adopted in the U.S., people would retire at 65 and then die at like 69. So they you know, basically had, they worked their entire life to then enjoy four years of retirement. The reality now is that, as, as we all know, people are living 80s, 90s, that's going to only go in one direction. And to expect people to be able to retire at 65 with defined contribution pension plans and be able to, to you know, live their retirement years enjoyably uh, will be far too challenging for too many people. So I think, I think it does make sense to, to increase the number to whatever. The, the downside uh -huh. is only that you then have entry level people who will not be able to enter the workforce because you have more people remaining in for, for a longer period of time. But overall, I think uh, you know, it does make a, a lot of sense and there should be discussion. I know there is been discussion about it right now. Yeah, in the interest of the sustainability of the uh, pension funds, yeah, it's, it's got to go up mm -hmm. north of, of, of 70 years, quite frankly. Um, there is a, a, another side to this, and it's to do with the unemployment rate among the young. Uh -huh. So for the, the young, we're talking sort of 20 to 25. Um, the unemployment rate in 2016 was 23%. Um, the overall unemployment rate in Bermuda is, is below um, 9%. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we can't afford to have those young people um, pack up and leave because that defeats the whole purpose. You know, of course, that means we've got to find more young people from, from another country to come here, which is going to make matters worse in terms of selling the idea of immigration. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, we, when we speak about immigration, I like to put repatriation first. Uh -huh. you know, there are many Bermudians overseas, and I'm, I'm thinking if, if I'm a young Bermudian and I hear the word immigration, what I hear is, you don't want me. Uh -huh. So perhaps when we, when we speak about immigration, maybe we should preface it by repatriation and immigration. Um, um, and, you know, of course, doing, doing concrete things to get that 23% unemployment rate among the young down. Um, so those are the challenges. It'd be nice to have some sort of number because everyone's out there floating some numbers of how many people, Bermudians are actually overseas. Not because um, Bermuda, well, because Bermuda doesn't offer them a, a career opportunity sort of thing. Um, not opposed to like some of those people who are elsewhere doing a, a career where they can only do those, but you know, bring those people back. Mm -hmm. If we had an a, actual number of how many of those people that would be beneficial. The statistics department did a study, I believe the year was 2013. They did a survey of uh, Bermudians who left the mm -hmm. island and a considerable uh, portion of those that left were young, qualified uh, Bermudians. And that's, that, that is disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to find a way to attract uh, these people back. Uh, in addition, and I think if we, if we make a concerted effort on the repatriation uh, line, I think immigration becomes a little easier. Mm -hmm. But when all we're talking about is immigration, um, I think people hear something else, right. um, something that isn't isn't pleasant, something that suggests that 
you know, my kind is not needed, and we're going to go elsewhere. Um, Which is part of the things you see in the pushback in the United States and the UK. Yes. When, you know, people hear immigration, it, it goes to that populist base that, you know, what about us first? Yes, and I'm not talking about this sort of a, a fascist nationalism. Uh -huh. But when we talk about civic pride, I mean that, that's a kind of nationalism at that basic level. I mean we don't we don't have that here. Um, we're, we're we just don't believe in ourselves, and I don't understand why that's the case. I mean you could say the weak economy, but even before when we were running hot and the economy was was booming, we were still sending our money overseas. I mean we've sent sort of tens of billions of dollars overseas. Um, why? I would tend to think it's because we can. And that perhaps, at least the evidence that I see, suggests that the only way to get people to dial it back is to say, well, you can. Yeah. I have less faith than John in, 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 the, in the human spirit. <laughs> but, but here again, Dawn, is, is another opportunity for a conversation. So we hear that often, um, while young people are going to be displaced. Okay, so let's get young people to the table. What do you need? Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you need to feel as though there is a place for you here, you should settle here and become, you know, remain a part of, of society? And older people have to listen to that. So we don't mm -hmm. have to maintain, they don't have to maintain their positions that they have. It, that's going to disrupt the opportunity for younger people to come behind because as an older population, we need these younger people. So is there other, are there other ways? Are there uh, retirement contracts that we can have that maybe you're not in your job, but there is still a pathway for a younger person? Is there, are there flexi Are there other ways mm -hmm. that you can maintain your employment, draw off your social insurance, continue to participate in the market, and not inhibit a younger person who is also needed in the economy and society from doing it? But we're not having those conversations. And we do need to have the big aging conversation mm -hmm. that includes all of these things, the reality of where we are. Right. I mean, part of the thing is like the economy's changed so much. Uh, we're, we're, today we're in the house, Bermuda, which is a cooperative wor working space. And we've seen like over the last 10 years, a lot more places like this mm -hmm. spring up because people aren't in traditional jobs anymore. That's right. So how do, how do we continue to foster that entrepreneurial spirit amongst Bermudians? Well, that might actually assist mm -hmm. because I always, I say jobs are getting out of style, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to learn how to exist in the market by having multiple functions in multiple places, young and old. And that would probably even the playing field mm -hmm. if it were that way. Well, if we're looking at jobs where you go in, you got your, that's your one job, your standard insurance, et cetera, and there's only a neat number of those jobs, then we have a problem. But that new, that new economy, that may be a place where you'll get the ballots. Right. And I think a lot of people have reinvented themselves the last few years out of necessity because they've been, you know, um, made redundant from position that they had until so they, they've had to reinvent themselves and maybe start their own business and I think to go back to the point we discussed before, what we need is that, that capital to, you know, to foster the growth of that business because I think there's some great ideas with some really energetic um, young people and they just need some assistance that, that they're having struggles with at the moment. One of the things that Craig brought up earlier, he talked about there were 530 uh, births <coughs> and 480 deaths last year. Um, and according to the, the census report, that numbers continue to go down. You know, they showed like in the 1970s, we were having over a thousand births a year, and then it was 900, 800, and, and by 2026, it's going to approach 400. What does this mean for education? Are schools going to have to close? Are we going to have to consolidate some? It's not a very popular topic amongst people, but when you have um, schools with 60 kids, 70 mm -hmm. kids, and I know L. James floated it when he was education minister back in 2010 and got a lot of pushback, but is that a reality for our future? Well, I mean, this, this is an, what I was talking about, experimenting. Mm -hmm. um, we need to experiment with education. Um, a heavily, a highly centralized education system uh, needs to be challenged. It, there needs to be disruption. 
Um, we've seen disruption in just about every facet of our economy, but we're not really seeing it in, in education. Uh, one great disruptor, potential disruptor in the education field would be a charter school. Mm -hmm. Charter school would work as follows. Um, uh, a government would, would provide a, a headmaster, a board of trustees, mm -hmm. with an amount of money based on the number of students. The students would be chosen randomly um, from a, a, a register, or some, some pool, and uh, the school's continued funding would be contingent on achieving certain standards, on maybe some standardized tests like the uh, SAT or, or mm -hmm. something, something like, like that. That would give uh, administrators, teachers, skin in the game. It would open the possibility for greater disruption, for risk taking. Now there's no guarantee that this will work, but at least I think you're providing the, the opportunity for, for disruption in the educational environment. And I think we're, we're lacking the testicular fortitude, mm -hmm. we're lacking the courage to actually try to experiment in the education system. I mean, we've seen it at, at the macro level, going, going to sort of middle schools and primary schools and senior secondary, mm -hmm. but rather than experiment with the entire system, why not try with one of these schools that you're thinking about closing, um, opening a charter school there? If it doesn't work, Really, you just you just shut it down. Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult thing to do with with the public system. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm in agreement. Um, I'm mother for oh, two 13 year olds now in public school. Um, public mm -hmm. school gets a worse rep than. Let me just say that I have mm -hmm. two 28 year olds went to public school, university educated, homeowners. One of them, wonderful, doing great. Okay, um, but the. It's clear that we are not able to um, maintain them and we cannot figure out a system of how to operate them. Um, I question bricks and mortar. Do we need it? That's where the expense mm -hmm. is. We're in the technology age. How much do we need bricks and mortar if we really want to be creative about it? Um, so if you're talking about the buildings, mm -hmm. I'm not terribly passionate about that subject at all because I do think there, we can be creative around how we deliver education. If you're talking about the infrastructure to educate, of course we're going to need that. We cannot attract young families here without a decent education system. That, that's not going to work. Yeah, we don't want to <laughs> give them the choice that, well, we're not confident in the public system, we're going to put them in private schools. Exactly. You, it just, and if you think about, you know, back in the day now, I'm a lot younger than these guys, but back in the day, <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. um, when I was, you know, in my, um, in high school, the public system, the, the, the school system, not just the, the, mm -hmm. the public system, it was a reputable system. People said they came to Bermuda because of the school system. And we will only attract people here if all of those pieces of there people can get good housing, they can educate their kids, they can afford to live here. So we need a good education system, public included. We do not have to be, I believe, so preoccupied with the physical infrastructure, whether that means we have to get rid of buildings, et cetera, et cetera. That's not where the media is. The media is on what, what you're providing and whether it's relevant for the future. And that's just my little pet. You can see that that gets me very upset because mm -hmm. we, we waste a lot of, we are wasting mm -hmm. a lot of time and money on maintaining mm -hmm. buildings. Right. Yet we're moving into an age, look at this space, mm -hmm. where that's not even going to be relevant, right. as relevant. Well, I think part of the thing is, I know some people who would like to see some of the schools closed, they said, well, if you have less buildings and there's, you have, you can do better maintenance if you're only having to take care of X number of buildings instead of Y, then situations where you got like the mold um, at T and Tatum is not much of an yeah. issue because then you have you can pay more attention to, to the buildings that you do have. That may be so, but don't tick that off in the box as we fixed education because mm -hmm. we got rid of some buildings or we upgraded some buildings. It's not that's not um, you know of, of critical importance what we're teaching, how we're teaching, and how relevant it is for where we're going.
Yeah. But I, probably it would be helpful if we had some stability in the Ministry of Education. You know, you could you know, you would have a long list of of either uh, ministers that we've had over the last twenty years, and permanent secretaries, and commissioners, and and it, it just seems like there's nobody there for a set number of time just to carry their vision through. But don't you think that's indicative of what uh, Craig is saying? Hmm. You know, we we don't have stability to, in that area because we're trying to do things through old means that are clearly not working for us. So yep. something has to change. Yeah, and hopefully we'll, we'll get some of that stability and, and, you know, we're not chopping and changing every three or four years, or, or, or in education's case, sometimes it's like every year or every two years. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the uh, government was proposing was a GST, which is supposed to raise $27.5 million um, over this coming year. How do you think this is going to impact uh, the country? Good idea, bad idea, or is it something that's that's needed? Well, I guess in the first necessarily <coughs> evil. In, in, necessary evil. In the first instance, I understand that there's a likelihood that that it certainly won't be considered for this year's 2019, 2020 budget. So I think it it may be in play for the following year, but I don't believe it's in scope at this point in time. But I guess you know, anytime uh, you know you try to tax labor. Uh -huh. um, you, you don't know the, the unintended consequences, so certainly some businesses that can move positions to other islands, perhaps will do that to avoid the tax. So whether we collect more than the offset by, having, by losing those people is anybody's guess. But, um, but I guess, as I say, it's out of scope for, for this year's budget, I understand. Yeah, a service tax, long overdue. Uh -huh. um, there has been a bias, I mean, we have customs duties. So if I'm bringing in stuff, if I'm a retailer, I would feel hard done by. So I'm bringing in shoes and water and cameras and everything, and I've got to pay duty. But my, my significant other runs a barbershop and a nail salon, and uh, she's not really paying the uh, same level of tax because she's selling services. This general service tax will level the, the playing field. It, it, it will, in fact, make it fair. Because right now, retailers are uh, uh, carrying the burden. They're paying, what, uh, $200 million in, mm -hmm. in, in excise and, and customs duties. Um, if done right, uh, a goods and, uh, sorry, a service tax could raise um, around $120 million. Uh, it's, it's been employed uh, extremely well in the Bahamas. It has helped them to, to, to put a significant dent in their debt. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing happened in Jamaica. Um, I'm just surprised that it's taken us so long. I don't know whether it's the fact that our debt is so large and our backs are up against the wall, but it's something that should have been addressed some time ago. Now, there's no tax in the world that isn't inflationary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So any tax that's introduced, whether it's a service tax, an increase in land tax, it's going to drive up prices. But it's something that will broaden the tax base, because right now it's rather narrow. Mm -hmm. It's based on, uh, on payroll not capital income, um, not so much on, on, on rental income, and on goods, and we need to broaden it. And uh, this is a, a definite step, uh, a good step. Um, unfortunately, it's not gonna happen this year. The infrastructure that's required for a service tax will take some time. And once it's in place, then entrepreneurs are gonna have to figure out how they're going to, uh, to work it. Now, I, I'm assuming there's going to be um, exemptions for small business. Mm -hmm. so if I'm running my barbershop and I've got maybe three barbers, I probably won't be um, subject to the tax. It'll be for larger, larger establishments. So I'm, I'm guessing that small businesses, businesses with a uh, volume of, say, under a, a million dollars, I think that's the way BDIC classifies a, a small business, would be exempt from it. But as you grow, there will be an expectation that you pay sales tax. So right. It's a good move on the part of the government. And then at the same time, it helps uh, promote the idea of equality that, you know, that's, they're not hammering the little guy over, yes. over this tax. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Do you think this budget does enough to, because I know the, the Progressive Labor Party really wants to, to make sure that the, there's a fair tax burden that, you know, the people at the top end are, are paying you know, more because they can afford to pay more and the people at the low end, you know, get a chance to, to, to step up and rise up. Do you think this, this pre-budget... It's, it's a difficult balance because if you stick it to the rich guy, 
mm -hmm. and girl, they'll leave. You know, so if you were to, um, so with payroll tax, I believe it's what anything over your, your not paying any payroll tax on income in excess of, is it 950000 or something like that? It's under a million dollars. So if I'm, if I'm getting paid $10 million by my employer, I'm not going to pay tax on over $9 million. But if you go after these people, they may just decide, you know what, I'm going to relocate. So you've got the mobility problem, where if you stick it too hard to the people at the top, they'll just move somewhere else. But at the same time, you need to stick it to them. And you need to give your people at the bottom a break. So one of the suggestions is to uh, make, say, the first $48,000 tax-free. So that would, that would really help people at the bottom. But that means now you've got to do it to people at the top. So it's a difficult balancing act. I think the government is moving in the right direction. Um, are we there yet? No, because it's a process. Um, democracy is messy. If you're going to increase land taxes, you're going to get pushback from the middle class. Um, uh, within the PLP, there are a lot of landowners, and they will feel betrayed that this government is coming after them. But that speaks to this sort of problem with me first, me second. Um, you've got to understand that public enemy number one is that $2.5 billion in, in on-balance sheet. We haven't even talked about the off-balance sheet debt, which is even bigger. Um, which has, has to be dealt with. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult um, path to navigate, uh, making the system fair, making it equitable, and maintaining efficiency. Um, it's a nightmare. I think there is a perception from the average person that no, it isn't fair, that we are paying way more than we would like to pay and that um, it's business as usual um, in many respects. And they already, in, in, in some instances, may feel betrayed um, you know, by even just the proposals of, of the original tax proposals. Um, it's challenging to um, find new ways quickly. Um, you know, we have to be measured um, but the average person is living their life paying their bills today. Um, and, you know, the money is leaving today. So um, it's, it's going to be challenging for the government um, to, to speak to uh, its base about um, the impact that is being felt by the inflation. Mm -hmm. Even if the uh, tax itself is not hitting um, the individual, the inflation will and it will feel very um, unfair. Um, I think people are looking for boldness and courage in doing something new and not business as usual with the small man in mm -hmm. mind. Right. Well, as we wrap up here, one uh, thing that you'd be hopeful to see in Friday's budget that maybe wasn't in the pre-budget report or one, one pleasant surprise or sort of thing that uh, Cur as Curtis Dickinson d delivers his first budget, what would you like to see? John? It's, is this not in the pre-budget report? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No taxes? No taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Unrealistic. No, I, I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, he came into his new job early November. Mm -hmm. There's no silver bullet here. Um, I don't think it's a case of what do I want to see or what it really is a case of um, being seen to be fair and equitable. Everybody feeling as though we're, we're tugging in the same direction. So I think, you know, if following Friday's budget, we can all say, okay, we understand the position we're in. We're all doing our, our bit. This is going to take years to get out of. And I think that's the best that we can, we can see coming out of Friday's budget. Claudette? Believe it or not, I'm going to say that um, I'd like to see the public support uh, the finance minister in the job that he has to do, um, recognizing that um, all of us will feel a bit of pain, um, but you know, committing ourselves to support the administration in getting the job done to, to get us out of the pain. Okay, thank you. Craig? Well, my, my response is going to be rather wonky. 
<laughs> um, payroll tax. There's two sides to it. There's the employee side and there's the employer side. On the employee side, we have a progressive system. Um, on the employer side, it doesn't work that way. Um, and so in terms of job creation, if you go from one uh, grade to the next, you could find your employer portion of the payroll tax jump by tens of thousands of dollars because it's based on an average. Um, I would like to see uh, the, 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 the treatment that's given to employees in terms of a progressive mm. and, and, and marginal tax schedule applied to employers. I think that would go a long way to making it more attractive for employers to take on additional employees. That would make me very happy. All right. I want to thank our panelists today, Craig Simmons from Marita mm -hmm. College, Dr. Claudette Fleming from Age Concern, and John White from BFNM and Chamber of Commerce. We will actually be back next Tuesday at noon. Um, Craig will be rejoining us along with his colleague Cordell Riley from the college and um, Cheryl Packwood. So I'm Don Burgess for Burr News, and I hope you have a Bermudaful afternoon. <laughs>